date him and a payment of his money. So there were several marriages. She married another man while she was perhaps married to John Noel or perhaps married to Rudolf Schultz, who um, came into some money as a result of a lawsuit. After about a year, she divorced him. And that's pretty much how, how it went up to the point where Ruth was an adult. But at that point, uh, May had accumulated enough money from her various schemes to start a movie company. She really loved film. She thought that Portland should be an alternative to Hollywood. She wanted to make it the next West Coast Hollywood. So she financed two films. And these are really kind of important historically because according to the papers um, of the time, these were the first uh, full-length motion pictures made in Portland. So she um, hired a man who was famous for making uh, nature films. Uh, basically, he would go around and film scenery, and it was more educational films. His name was uh, Muma. And she hired him to direct Ruth in a couple of films. One was called A Nugget in the Rough, and another was called A Tale of a Dress. And she it looks like she greased some palms because at the movie's premiere, Everyone was there, including the mayor of Portland. All the major civic organizations were present. There was huge press coverage. One of the theaters bought this gigantic organ just to play music during the films. Portland um, actually was really behind this. They actually held a, a motion picture convention in Portland, hoping that this was the start of something great. Well, the uh, two films played for all of a week. They were very well reviewed by Portland critics, and by no one else. And then they stopped their run. So May had invested all of her money in these two films with Ruth as a star, had received all this uh, local publicity, but in the end, nobody else wanted to see the films. So they, they flopped. And that's really where the division comes between May's early life and the start of what would become her life as a cult priestess. And what happens next relies heavily on this very strong connection she has with her daughter, Ruth, who happened to be an exotic dancer. Tell us more about Ruth. Sure. Well, yeah, Ruth, of course, at this point was a, a fairly young woman. She was 17 years old when these films were made. Uh, she still called her mother by the name of May. She knew that May was her mother, but they'd lived so long at um, acting as sisters that for, for decades, they would still refer to each other um, as my sister. And it's not clear if that was occasionally part of an act of full reporters, but it appears that was the relationship. They were, they were very close, though there were reports later uh, when some reporters interviewed Ruth that she seemed what they called mentally darkened. So she, she, she loved dancing. She loved singing. And actually, I guess just to uh, further the story, what happens is May and Ruth will go to Los Angeles. They fell to making movies in Portland. So May's idea is, that's fine, not a problem. We'll pick up everything. We'll go to Hollywood. We'll make films in Hollywood. I'll become a director. Ruth, you'll try out for some parts in movies, and we'll just start over. It doesn't work out. Ruth gets a few parts as a bit actress. Um, no one wants to hire May for anything. You know, Ruth, of course, is very beautiful. Uh, everyone talks about her, her beauty. She was, it was a seductive beauty. It was a hypnotizing beauty. And she was considered uh, a woman of many loves, was uh, a phrase reporters often used. So when she couldn't find steady work as an actress, she began to take up dancing professionally to help support them. They still had some money left over, but not much. And she took up really two careers, one as a taxi dancer and the other is an oriental dancer. Now, the taxi dancing that Ruth did, that was common in the era. There were these studios, which were taxi dancing studios. And what they would have is a large collection of girls. And men would go to these places, and they would buy tickets. And they would be uh, a dime per ticket. And if a gentleman uh, approached one of the girls and gave her the ticket, she'd have to dance with him. That was... That was part of the, the job. Now, a lot of these taxi dancing studios, uh, as I write in my book, weren't on the up and up. A lot of them were really into prostitution. And this was just a chance for men to go in, find a girl they were attracted to, 
and they may or may not reach a deal to meet afterwards for something uh, less wholesome than dancing. Uh, they weren't all like that, but apparently a great many were. She also took on dancing as an oriental dancer. The difference between taxi dancing and oriental dancing is that oriental dancing, which was again popular at the time, is where a woman would dress up as if she were a dancer from Egypt or China or Japan or just name any exotic place. And they would they would dance in front of an audience and Uh, a poster Ruth is out dancing. Ruth seems pretty happy with just just dancing and making a little bit of money and dating some men and collecting money like that. But May is not happy. May is looking for the next big con. And she she spends her days at home reading the Bible. Now, at some point early after they get, they get in L.A., Ruth marries a man named Jack Rickenbaugh. And Jack Rickenbaugh would later report that Ruth had no interest at all in religion, not at all. May just would read her Bible, according to Jack. About um, one year after Ruth got married, she got separated from Jack and started dating some other guys from the taxi dancing place. One of them was a man named Arthur Osborne, young man who worked in the oil fields in uh, Los Angeles. He worked at the Sanchez Ranch, I believe, also. So Arthur was dating her, and everything was going okay. He, she was a little cold, but they would they would date, and at one point. Ruth begins asking for money because she says that her and her mother, May, uh, are writing a book and they need the book financed. And Arthur says, well, what kind of book is it? And she says, well, it's the book that's going to solve all the world's problems. It's going to be called it's called the seventh trumpet of Gabriel. And it's going to explain everything, how to live forever, how to find hidden gems and gold deposits, uh, the lost measurements of Solomon, which will enable you to do anything you want to in life. And so Arthur says, well, that's interesting. Exactly where are you coming by all this knowledge? And May says that the angel Gabriel has been appearing to her and May in their home each night and dictating this book to them. And that when the book is finished, it will bring about the apocalypse sometime in February of 1925. Arthur we don't really know what he thought at the time. He he probably thought she was joking with him or was going a little crazy, but he wanted to keep dating Ruth. So he did lend her some money and Ruth uh, took it. 
And then Ruth said, well, we need a little bit more money. Could you maybe borrow some from your employer, Sanchez Ranch? And Arthur said, sure, he could do that. And then he kind of disappeared for a while because he began to second guess this entire thing. It really, he began to suspect he was being taken advantage of. Uh, and at that point, Ruth wrote him several letters, which would later appear in court. And there, we can actually read them today, which gives you some insight into how she was trying to man manipulate Arthur, saying, you know, hey, how's that loan coming about? I really miss you. We'd really love to see you. You know, we've had some great years ahead of us. If you could just get that loan from your friend, tell him we'll pay him over a thousand times over as soon as this book is done, because we're going to be filthy rich. So eventually he did. Uh, Arthur borrowed this money, upwards of $150, which is a lot of money at the time. And he lent it to Ruth. And Ruth said, thank you. And they kept dating for a little bit longer. And then she said, you know what? It's not just the book. The angel Gabriel's now told us we have to set up an entire religious order which means buildings and all these additional costs. So we need more money. Well, at this point, Arthur's been fired for not repaying his other loans. He can't get his hands on any more money. So um, he tells his dad. His dad storms over to May and Ruth's house. He's, he probably realizes what's going on. And he may meets him at the door. And Arthur's dad says, you know, basically your daughter has been taking money from our son, not paid it back. He lost his job. Uh, give us our money back. And May goes ballistic on him. Uh, she starts screaming at him. There may have been some physical altercations, but he leaves without any money. And May follows this up by calling Arthur's mom and saying, hey, your husband's just over here. If he comes over again, I'm going to kill him. And, you know, Arthur would later play that down, saying, oh, he was just probably joking. But May probably wasn't joking. May probably would have killed him, as we'll you know learn later. So the Arthur saga uh, concludes with... He's all dejected. He's lost his job. He goes and enlists in the army and he goes back to May's house to say his final goodbyes. And May and Ruth are gone. The house is deserted. They're nowhere to be found. And uh, Arthur ships off to boot camp. So they're on their way. And this book becomes the first of many that they write. How does this thing turn from an idea to something more substantial? How, how do they start finding and recruiting disciples. Right. So in many ways, Arthur was sort of at the beta. It's like, well, let's see if we can actually convince this man that we're actually getting dictation from angels and writing this, this book. And it worked. So May, who's really the mastermind, uh, Ruth is an accomplice and, and her, her good looks and charm are very valuable to May. But May is really the, the, the brain power behind this. So they go back to Portland where they have some connections. And they basically start networking and they build upon this story that they told um, Arthur, which is that the apocalypse is coming, but it's not going to be exactly like the apocalypse that the Bible described. What's going to happen is the world's going to be transformed from its current form to another form. And in this new world, there's going to be 11 queens who are going to be selected by the angel Gabriel to rule the world. And the angel Gabriel has promised these 11 queens, 11 mansions, which are going to be built on an olive hill in Hollywood. And each of these 11 queens are going to get 12 kings uh, as part of a harem, for lack of a better word. And they're also going to be given all the jewels and gold in the world and great power. Well, this was, it sounds outlandish, but, uh, you know, maybe nine out of 10 people would reject this as, as crazy. But one out of 10 recipients or whatever the actual number was actually bought into it. Uh, and part of this was that May would bring these chests with her and these chests contain these huge bundles of paper. And the top sheet would have all this metaphysical gibberish on it. It, it wouldn't make any sense to anyone. And then later, you know, reporters saw it and they said, this is absolute garbage. This means nothing. But it looked es esoteric. And May would take these uh little drafts and she would poke them on top of a hundred pages of blank paper and wrap them up with twines. So you couldn't really look beneath that top page. And she would take this giant chest and say, look, I've got 30,000 pages dictated by the angel Gabriel. And if you just look at this, you can tell it's divine. And the people who believed her looked at it and actually bought into this. Like, wow, this must be from an angel because I don't understand it. And it looks very esoteric. 
Uh, so they signed up. And basically what she would do is she would, she would develop this, this enclave and she got money from them, at least early on, by saying, we need support in establishing this new religion. We need to get this book financed. We can't work. We're the, oh, and I'm sorry, she identified herself and Ruth as the two witnesses from Revelation. So they were actually the two witnesses described as being the uh, voices, uh, voice persons for God at the end of the world. So there's sort of a double enticement. One, a lot of these were poor people. It was mostly women initially who were looking for a way out of poverty. Uh, they were probably fairly religious, but obviously open-minded. The idea of ruling the world from a mansion on Olive Hill in Hollywood sounded uh, very desirable. So that that's where she uh, she began to build up steam in Portland about that time. Part of what she would do was that in exchange for money, she would offer these people titles, assign her followers special names. What were some examples of this and why did she do it this way? Sure. So even though she was passing off everything she said as um, from the Bible, as a form of Christianity, as I you know discussed in my book, it was really almost a form of paganism. It was a form of magic that she was promising. And what she said was, and the religion is very complicated because a lot of it was just made up on the fly. But when Adam and Eve had uh, eaten from the tree of life, they had uh, basically reversed the, the, the pump that makes the world worth. The way the tree of life is supposed to work is that it pumps out the old and pumps and new. So nothing ever ages. Everything that is old is constantly being replaced by something new. That's the way the tree of life was supposed to work. And when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of life, they, they threw a monkey wrench into the works and made the tree of life work backwards, it became a backwards pump. So the young became old when the older was supposed to become new. So building upon that, she thought that she had to have a concord established between the earth and the spiritual world, which meant that there was always, it, it kind of goes back to sort of a hermetic philosophy, as above, so as above, so below, so below, as above, where anything you do on earth will be repeated or will reach a harmonic state with the universe and make things actually happen. So she, there were concords took two forms. One was rituals, which I think we'll probably talk about later. But the other is that she would actually assign these these concord names to people, and these concord names were supposed to put that person in harmony with some important concept of the universe. So, uh, for example, Gail Conde Banks was one of her followers, and his concord was the four winds of the whirlwind god. Winifred Banks was the circling of the minor scale and the harmony of music, which is a very long name to be called. Uh, Nellie Banks was the queen of the scaling breath on the inside of the body. Her mom, uh, Jenny Blackburn, was equal balance and justice. Her own name was the North Star or the Hill of God. Uh, there were other names like the Grand General of the North Star, the Holy Keystone, the Hereafter and Now, the Still Waters, the Gravitation Upwards, the Eternal Circle of the Taste. It just goes on and on. Basically, anyone who followed her had one of these Concord names, which tied them in some positive way to the universe. She's got a mix of followers at this point. Some some seem pretty normal, <laughs> on paper anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> and some are really creepy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of them, a man that would ultimately become May's husband, was Ward Sitton Blackburn. What was his role in this organization and his relationship to May? Right. So I guess Ward Blackburn's biggest contribution is his name. Uh, the, this uh, cult is also well known as the Blackburn cult. But of course, he was actually the son of Walter Blackburn, who had married May's mother. Now, when May and Ruth were in Portland, they moved in with her mother and uh, Walter Blackburn and Ward Blackburn, who at that time was her stepbrother. And at some point, it appears that they got close, which is kind of surprising because Ward Blackburn had some issues. He was allegedly uh, a pedophile. Uh, he was supposed to um, have gone after children, but he, he also had some very curious uh, personal habits. He would wear his clothes for days on end without washing them. He had a, 
uh, sort of a Fu Manchu sort of mustache. He, he liked to dress himself as an oriental mystic. And it looks like he went to great lengths to make himself look oriental with greased back hair and like I said, this long mustache. And he was also not very smart. You know, they would interview friends later and they'd say, well, he was, he was never quite right. But May would eventually actually marry this man who was her stepbrother. And she would assign him with really trivial duties like sitting at windows and counting cars or counting trains or measuring rain in a cup. And he took a lot of pride in these duties. He would often brag up to reporters how his entire job was to sit at the window and count cars for his wife. So he was the most gifted person. It's kind of funny because when this cult, uh, when the grade 11 was first discovered by reporters, this would be 10 years later, he was in hiding and everyone thought, aha, he's the mastermind. He's, he's the guy behind this, this uh, Blackburn cult. It's not May. May is just the, the person who's taken the, the hit. But he's the real mastermind. And as soon as they interviewed the guy, they're like, no, no, not the mastermind. It was, it was May. So he was a very interesting character. And from your accounts, there was no marital intimacy between the two. And you hint in your book that she might have been finding him girls to sort of satiate his pedophilia. Yeah, it's unclear exactly what was going on. We do know that, uh, like I said, he was an accused uh, pedophile. She, there were several occasions where she attempted to um, either entice young girls into the cult or in some cases just to abduct them. There were two cases that are, that are known where uh, one, she went into a, a store and walked right up to a, a woman and her daughter and told the woman, you know, you, get the, you have a beautiful daughter. Uh, will you give her to me? And if you give her to me, I'll dress her up very nice and take very good care of her. And the woman was terrified. She said, no. But the woman, you know, would, would say she spent the rest of her life afraid of Mae Blackburn, that she was going to come and abduct her daughter. And there was another case where uh, a car stopped. Uh, she had this giant Lincoln. This is in the, the height of the cult. And it was she had a driver, a very large driver. And he got out of the car while she was in it and walked up to a child who was in the front yard playing. And they were he was probably a foot away from abducting this child before the parent came out with a, a shotgun and ran them off. So there are several cases where May actually apparently attempted abductions, but there was also the case of Willa Rose, which I guess we'll talk about later, who, who was uh, a young girl. She was 14, I think, when they first met, and uh, she made her a queen of the cult uh, and had her brought down to Los Angeles. And, of course, they had some tragic consequences. So it's, it's not really clear if she was trying to pull in these young girls into the cult for board or if she had some personal interest herself. It's just not clear. There were a lot of weird things going on. So how does May build this empire? M much of it has to do with her, her charisma, wouldn't you say? Right. Yeah. And actually, a lot of reporters later, and it would, it would come out in some of the uh, trials, that she had a hypnotic ability about her. Later at trial, when, people, when the judge or the lawyers would say, how could you believe such outlandish stuff? Every one of them, and some of these were some very educated people, would say, you'd have to know her. If you talk to this woman, I know all this sounds crazy now, but when she says it to you, you believe it. She had that certain uh, quality, and I think, you know, we hear about this uh, with other cult leaders. They just got this, this magic about them where they can tell you to do the most preposterous things, and for whatever uncanny reason, people believe it. You know, and, and of course, this happens with other cult leaders, right? We talk about uh, Charles Manson or any number of others where you would think, looking back at uh, history shows, how would anyone actually believe what they're being told that they do? Now, May was also targeting a very good audience initially, the, the impoverished who were looking for, for a better life. She was also reaching out to a lot of Christian scientists and fringe Christian scientists. And she would sort of cater her, her doctrine according to her audience. So for them, she would appeal to uh, their, their belief system. And one of her earliest recruits was a woman named Martha Rhodes, who was very prominent in Christian science circles in Klamath County, Oregon. She and her husband, William, they were the parents of a girl named Willa Rhodes. And Martha 
uh, Rhodes actually had her own, the people at the time called it a cult, it was at least an organization of faith healers who practiced uh, ritual healing. And Martha was to the point where she claimed she could raise the dead. She claimed that she'd raised herself back from the dead, which is a, a pretty neat trick. So she pulled Martha into her circle and Martha brought her own group of followers. Pretty much anyone you see from Portland uh, or the Oregon area that was in the early cult, a lot of those came from Martha. So Martha and May together, Martha though was different from May. May was a con artist. She may or may not have had delusions about some of the things she said. Uh, it seemed like she might've actually believed some of them, but it looks like in most cases she was just making stuff up. Martha was a true believer. She actually believed she could raise the dead. She thought she could heal people. So she wasn't involved in the con, but she did bring a lot of people in who trusted Martha. And one of these was Gail Banks, who's a very prominent, a very well-educated figure, very smart. He would actually become May's translator. He would send, and this is interesting, he actually sent, she had, Martha actually called up Gail Banks and said, you know, I've met this woman, May Otis Blackburn, it's amazing. I think she really is one of the two witnesses of God. I think she has fantastic insights. I want you to go to Boston, where the, the headquarters of the uh, Church of uh, Christian Science was at the time. I'm sorry, but I'm not sure the actual institution's name is. It's in the book. And I want you to tell them that May Otis is a prophetess and that they need to actually make her part of the uh, religious establishment. And amazingly, Gail, again, he's a very smart guy. He's a sergeant major at a military academy. He quits his job. He goes to Boston. Uh, he goes and says, hey, this, this woman's a prophetess. You need to accept her as a prophetess. And they basically kick him out the door, and he's taken off the roles of Christian science, which he's been a member of for like 20 years. So he goes back, but he's still a believer. So all these this weird menagerie of people who are poor just looking for something to believe in, Christian scientists who aren't really necessarily Christian scientists. They, they start off as Christian scientists, but they, they go much further afield. They, they get in a very wobbly orbit uh, around mainstream Christian science. There's also people who are just greedy. May is promising gold and jewels and all this hidden power. And there are some people who are like, well, I don't really believe much of that, but what if it is true? I could just throw a few dollars at this and see if it pays off. So there, there, it was a huge collection, and May was just very good at surveying uh, the people around her, seeing what their needs were, and using her basically hypnotic powers to pull these people into her orbit. Uh, it was tricky maybe getting them to stay there, but she also had Ruth, who was a very attractive, and people like uh, Gail Banks were very smart at writing stuff up. So she had a lot of resources um, available to her. At this cult's peak, how much money did they have? Did she have? Uh, what were her assets? Well, so they moved into a house in Los Angeles at 640 South Manhattan. That became sort of the, the cult dorm, a very nice place, a, just sort of a mansion. It was a very big house. It was rented to them by a couple called Edna and Frank Vogel, who were millionaires, real estate millionaires. There's some debate about how much money they may or may not have given to the cult, but I'm going to I'm going to guess some. She also got a lot from her followers, especially her followers' relatives. She would convince her followers to uh, give her money that might be from life insurance. If a relative's husband or wife had died, uh, she would ask for that money. If they had some sort of military pension, she would ask for that money. If they'd come to any kind of windfall at all, she would ask for that money. She also prohibited any of the men in the cult from working. This was a very female-oriented cult. Uh, all the offices were held by uh, women. All the spokespeople were women. And most of the men were prohibited from, from working, or if they were allowed to work, they had to turn over their paychecks to May. So May was uh, collecting all the paychecks from all the men and also all the females. She was getting donations. Oh, she would sell the Concords, these fancy names that she would give to people to make them, to put them in harmony with the universe. She would sell them, depending on who the audience was, for between $500 and $2,000. Whether you're searching for record players, they go out and get these large blocks of ice, they put them in the bathtub, 
and they take Willow's body and they put it on top of the ice. At this point, Jenny Blackburn, who's May's mother, does something that's <laughs> extremely suspicious to say the least. She would later claim that one of the dogs, one of the seven puppies that she gave Willa had died on its own and that she decided it was only proper that the other puppies also be with Willa. So she chloroformed them to put them to sleep and they spontaneously died. And they put the seven puppies around Willa's body in a ritualistic fashion. weeks they just leave her there they're bringing fresh roses every day uh, to honor her body but she's essentially lying in state now a few weeks after that may says well we, we can't keep doing this we need to uh, move her body to a place where it's going to be harder to find because she's going to get resurrected it's just a matter of time it's taking longer than we expect but it's going to happen so they move her to another house and this time she doesn't get the royal treatment they they build this little additional shack onto the house, just a few feet tall. And they put Willa in there in the sort of makeshift coffin that her father makes. Her father, her father was a handyman. He used to work in a lumber mill. And so he builds her like this, this little coffin and they fill it with ice. And the seven puppies are still with her in a separate box. And we would later find out when, uh, when one of the trials began that there was a nice delivery man who had come to this house and he was bringing 600 pounds of ice a week to the house because that's what it took in the Los Angeles weather to preserve the body. And at one point he asked, you know, it was an innocent question. He, he had no idea there was a body in the house, but he asked the uh, roads, you know, why do you need 600 pounds of ice for your house? And they came up with this ludicrous response that, well, we, we melted down for um, water for our religious services, which of course is a preposterous answer, but it was the best they could come up with. Now, this went on for uh, several months before May uh, finally went to the roads and said, you know what? The resurrection is just not imminent. Uh, she's not going to rise from the dead anytime soon. So we need to bury her in a more permanent fashion. She had them by a um, house out in Venice uh, at a place called Marco Place. And she said, we're going to bury your daughter. But we're going to bury her in such a fashion that when she rises from the dead, she's going to have access to the surface. So William Rose, another cult member by the name of uh, Floyd Miller, tore up the floorboards of one of the bedrooms. And they dug these cavities in the ground beneath it. They built two new coffins and they copper lined them and welded the uh, seams to make them waterproof. And they buried these coffins into the ground, but like I said, they only went about two feet. So basically when the lid covered the coffin, the lid was still above the earth and they put the dogs in one of them. Now, while they're doing this, Martha Rhodes has gone off to a, a druggist. And according to the druggist, his testimony later was that she had this ancient script with her, with this ancient recipe. And he, she had him put together these spices and all these drugs and ointments and bottled it. And it cost her like $25. She took it back. While the men were still digging the graves, she began uh, doing basically a surface embalmment of Willa's body to preserve it. Now, this was strictly superficial. It was on her skin. It wasn't, there was no internal embalming like the Egyptians did. And then they had uh, Willa wrapped up in a, a white cloth along with the dogs. They put her in a ritual position, which was the, with her knees drawn up to her chest and her arms over her knees on her side in this coffin. They put the lids on the coffins of Willa and the uh, seven uh, murdered puppies, for lack of a better word, because they, they surely were killed. Put the floorboards back on loosely with the thought, at least the roads legitimately thought that Willa and or the dogs were going to come back to life. So th this entire thing was set up so that when Willa did wake up, she would be able to move the lid off the coffin, move the floorboards aside, 
and crawl up to the surface, which is one of the, you know, the creepiest things I can imagine because this, this was the bedroom her parents slept in. So every night for what would become years, they were sleeping directly above their, the mummified body of their daughter and these dogs, waiting for them, waiting for their daughter to wake up and knock on the floor or just to move the floorboards aside. It's, it's a scene straight up a horror movie if you think about it, but this was their great hope. Yeah, that that's just gruesome. Just gruesome. Yeah, it's it's remarkable. <laughs> there are a lot of really interesting stories in this book, and we obviously won't be able to get to all of them today, of course. But I want to ask you about Sam Bizio, Ruth's husband, who seemed to have disappeared under mysterious circumstances, right? Right. So what happened was in 1924, when they moved, first moved to their, uh, when May and Ruth had first started setting up their cult headquarters at 640 South Manhattan, uh, Ruth started dating a uh, young Italian-American, 17 years old at the time, by the name of Samuel Rizzio, and knew about what was going on um, as far as Ruth had some very peculiar beliefs. She was surrounded by some very peculiar people. It all seemed very weird. He was a straight Catholic guy, but he did have a troubled family past. His father was uh, wanted for a triple homicide related to the, the black hand, which was sort of a early form of mafia. Uh, a lot of it, um, Italian Americans were involved in. So his father was on the, the run. He was living with his mother in Los Angeles, but after a few months of dating, uh, he and Ruth married. And it was sort of an unusual situation because he married her probably thinking that once they get married, he's going to convince Ruth to move out of this place with all these weird people. They're going to set up a, a new home. It's going to be a very traditional family, right? He's going to be the head of the family. He'll get a job. He'll provide for Ruth. Um, but that's not what happened. Uh, when he tried to get Ruth to leave the cult, she said, no, I'm I'm a queen. I'm, I have all the power in the world. We're making good money here. Why would I want to give all this up? And that made him angry. And there's different accounts. Ruth, May, and some of the other Black Burns and cult members will later say that Sammy was violent and that one time he, he, he struck Ruth. And that was what led to events that followed. It is possible that he was violent, but we also, <laughs> Sammy was never around to defend himself. So what happened was, Supposedly, one day, Sammy struck Ruth on the head during an altercation, and uh, he left the house. This is the Blackburn story. He left the house, and he never came back. And that was the end of it. He just took off. He was just so upset, he couldn't bear it anymore. Now, what actually came out later was that he and Ruth were having frequent arguments, and May didn't approve of the marriage. So May requested one of the uh, cult members, uh, Eleanor Sandrosky. She was a pharmacist. Her and her husband were both members of the Divine Order. Eleanor Sandrosky's Concord was the rainbow. And she summoned Sandrosky to her house. And she said, I've just heard from an angel. I've got a new command. Now, stay to yourself because this is unbelievable. But the angel Gabriel has says, we, we must kill. Samuel Rizzio. And Sandrosky is like, we have to what? And she says, we have to kill Samuel Rizzio. It's, it's an order from an angel. And he said that we need a poison. It needs to be the kind of poison that can't be traced. Could you maybe cook something up like that for us so we could get this over with? And Sandrosky, you know, she's stunned. And you don't just say no to May. She had that kind of power. So she said, I don't know. I'll have to go and talk to my husband. And May saw Pedals and says, fine, go talk to your husband. Uh, see what you can do. But when you can, get me this poison. So Eleanor goes back. She talks to her husband. And her husband's like, no, this has gone too far. You know, the, the, we know something's wrong. We, we kind of bought into the early uh, preachings of May, but she's, she's gone too far this time. We're going to quit the cult. Go back and tell her we're quitting the cult. So Drusky goes back and says, we're quitting the cult. And May says, no, no, you're not. This is your husband's evil influence on you. He's not your right husband. I want you to marry another man. And she brings this other man to the room and says, you're going to marry Eleanor. And uh, he says, but I've already got like two other wives that you made me marry. You're going to marry her anyways. And she actually goes off in this, you know, really this tirade, basically says, 
look, if you don't give me um, the poison, your bones are going to crumble to dust. Uh, so Sandrosky leaves. Later on, they have another meeting. And now, now May is really soft peddling this. She says, I think you misunderstood. We don't need to actually kill Samuel Rizzio. We're going to have a ceremony. And the ceremony is going to be a whirling dervish ceremony. The problem is Samuel is acting the way he does with my daughter because he's got 10 dead priests on his shoulder, some sort of metaphysical uh, curse. So we're going to take this poison and we're going to make a circle around him with this poison. He's going to swirl 10 times around. And he's going to say, I'm a dead priest. After he does these uh, 10 spins, uh, he'll be free of these uh, metaphysical priests and he'll be a healthy member of the cult. I mean, it sounds kind of like brainwashing. So owner's like, oh, well, okay, if it's just a ceremony, sure. So do you actually need poison? And May says, well, here's the thing. The angel Gabriel told me, even though this is only a ceremony, it's got to be real poison. So uh, Elner uh, goes back and tells her husband, and uh, her husband says, okay, you know, that's, we, we've got to quit this. But Eleanor knows that May is going to be coming forward for the poison. So she, she says later that she mixes some colored dye with water, and she's going to give this to May as the poison. The next day, a woman named Mary Stewart, uh, her concord was the ointment of God. She's basically the um, courier and personal assistant for May Blackburn, shows up at the pharmacy, gets the poison, also gets a bottle of chloroform, which uh, apparently was also needed for the ceremony, uh, and disappears. And at that point, the Sidorovskis actually quit the cult and aren't harassed anymore. Shortly after that, they said they had the ceremony. This uh, Again, this is the Blackburn's account. They had the ceremony. They went to a beach. Sammy did his spins. He got free of the angels or the, uh, the dead priests that were haunting him. His behavior was corrected. And at that point, he took off. So we have some very different accounts of what happened uh, to Samuel Rizzio, but he never reappeared. I actually, uh, not too many months ago, I actually heard from one of the descendants of the, the Rizzio family who had stumbled upon my book somehow, and they he confirmed, he said, you know, we never knew what happened to Samuel Rizzio. I had never even seen, he was, he was the uh, nephew of Samuel Rizzio, said, I'd never even seen a picture of uh, my Uncle Samuel until I saw your book and saw the newspaper picture in it. And he said, you know, when they were, when he was growing up, there were all these little whispers about what might have happened to Sammy way back when, but they didn't really like talking about it. But he never resurfaced. Uh, the man disappeared. So, you know, you can <laughs> you can make your own decision about what happened to him. Uh, you know, maybe he did run off to Chicago to uh, join his father, avenge his father's uh, death. His father died some years later. But it, it's very suspicious, the circumstances of, of his disappearance. So the whirling dervish ceremony, you, you just sort of spin around? Right. This, this was what um, this was May's, uh, May's account at trial, you know, years later, is that basically the ceremony, if you made 10 spins uh, in sand with a poison circle, with a circle of poison around you, and you said, I am a dead priest, I am a dead priest, I'm a dead priest, after 10 rotations, the um, tended priest would fly away from you and your mind would be free and you, you would realize that May's theology is the right theology. So it's just like he was saying he was too Catholic. He will do this ceremony as commanded by the angel of Gabriel. And he'll be free. There'll be a ceremonial death. This was her later story. So he's not really going to be killed. It's a ceremonial death. But of course, knowing what we know, it seems likely that yeah, he was probably killed. So please, for anyone out there thinking about trying this at home, don't do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> or at, at least if you use poison, make sure it's the colored water type. <laughs> it's interesting that he would want to participate in something like this. He, he wanted to leave, right? He, he didn't want anything to do with this cult. No, if, if I, you know, my suspicion is, would be that you recall that uh, Mary Stewart also got a bottle of chloroform. Uh, and that's, well documented. So chloroform was not supposed to be part of this ceremony. So we can only, con you know, use conjecture at this point, but it seems most likely that at some point May got tired of Sammy um, and his altercations with Ruth. He, she didn't want Ruth leaving. And there's a very good likelihood that he was just chloroformed in his sleep or something and poisoned, and they managed to dispose of his body. And all this stuff about whirling dervish ceremonies was made up years later 
to try to explain why the poison was needed. Hmm. So how did things start to unravel for the Blackburns? Right. So oddly enough, it comes about as a result of one of May's earliest and richest followers. It was a man named Clifford Dabney. Clifford Dabney was um, the nephew of J.B. Dabney, who was the uh, owner of the Dabney Oil Syndicate, which was making a lot of money. He, he was a millionaire. He gave a lot of his money to uh, educational institutions. And it's also notable in that while during the same period, Raymond Chandler, the famous writer, actually worked for Dabney. I think he started out as a secretary, got as high as vice president before he was actually fired because of alcoholism. So there's a real possibility that Raymond Chandler may have come into contact with some of these uh, Blackburn individuals. But essentially, the, uh, the the deal was J.B. Dabney operated the oil fields and he hired his nephew, Clifford Dabney, to go and find properties that they could lease to put oil fields on. So Clifford made money by trying to find property that he could buy or rent, transferring those uh, titles to his his uncle, and he'd get a share of the profits. Somehow he got in contact with uh, May Blackburn. Well, actually, May Blackburn got in contact with him. It's not clear exactly who this intermediary was. They said there was an elderly woman who knew both of them. So he he and his wife go and talk to May. And actually, now, Clifford Dabney and his wife, very wealthy, plenty of money, very well educated, upstanding citizens. So they're not like some of the other uh, members of the cult who are the downtrodden and poor uneducated. And May says, well, if you're looking for oil, you know, my book that I'm about to publish, The Great Sixth Seal, she, and by the way, she changed them. It used to be the seventh trumpet of Gabriel. She changed it to The Great Sixth Seal. They're all made up books. It didn't matter. She would use whatever name she wanted to at the time. But she says, when I publish this book, it's going to have Solomon's Lost Measurements in it. It will tell you how to find the oil. It, gold, gems, anything, it can also find oil. Now, Clifford Dabney was involved. Apparently, he had some pretty interesting beliefs. There were a lot of accusations made against him later by cultists saying that, you know, you think they've got crazy beliefs. This guy's got really crazy beliefs. But that was at trial, and they were trying to protect May. So there's no telling what, uh, what the, the veracity of their stories were. So anyway, Clifford uh, agrees. He says, okay, fine, I'll help finance your book because I really would like to find these um, oil reserves. And he ends up giving her a few thousand dollars. He buys the Concord. His Concord is the hereafter and now. Uh, he gets his wife a Concord. Uh, she becomes a holy keystone. And he also buys them huge tracts of land out in the Santa Susana Hills, a place uh, called Mortar Park at the time. So over the years, uh, he invests more and more money in this cult, hoping for this book to be published to the point of actually financing a printing press to try to make it happen faster. The entire time actually believing she's writing a book being dictated by angels, which will make him wealthier through oil leases. And she was very good at bringing him along for the entire journey by making these promises. And she also made him president at one point, which was an absolutely pointless title. It meant nothing you know, in the cult. Uh, they would uh, involve them in rituals, and it went on and on to the point where eventually Clifford Dabney, after several failed attempts because they intimidated him, but finally in 1929, uh, Clifford goes to the authorities and says, I've been defrauded. Uh, May Blackburn's the woman. I want to sue her. I want all my money back. And the police at the time were like, so you gave this woman all your money because she was promising this stuff? Uh, you really don't have much of a basis. You're free to believe. I mean, she was promising you supernatural results. We can't really hold a woman to anything because it's just like a, if, you were, if she were a preacher or a priest, they make promises of supernatural events, but you can't go sue them when they don't happen. So initially, they're not very sympathetic to his case, but he is fairly wealthy and he has some influence. So they start looking into it. And as a result of that, at the Center of Susanna, Susanna Conley, uh, we skipped over a lot of the history there, but there had been some deaths. And they start looking into those deaths, and they publicize that they're looking into these deaths. And what happens is reports start coming in from all over the place. Relatives of the cultists who haven't seen their relatives for a long time start writing and saying, hey, I heard so-and-so was there, and they've been, dis they've been missing for years. But the most important part was when someone called and said, do you know a girl named Willa Rhodes? And the police like, no idea. And they said, well, you need to talk to their parents because she's dead. 
And the police said, well, what do we do? And they give basically this anonymous caller gives the police the address of um, William and Martha Rhodes. So they go down there, they show up. There's this very awkward conversation where the police are actually saying, uh, you know, we, we heard that your daughter's died. We need to know where she is. Martha goes into hysterics. Eventually, the police convince the Rhodes to come clean and they start tearing up the floorboards and um, recovering the body of Willow Rose and the dogs. And because this was the 1920s, the press are on it immediately. The press are in the front line. They're everywhere. They're taking pictures of the coffins. The police actually open one of the coffins and the mummified dogs in there and they take pictures of this. And there's these, you know, these pictures are still available. So at that point, that's a huge story and it goes nationwide. So that's when all the dirty laundry of the cult, and there's a lot of dirty laundry we didn't talk about, obviously, but everything comes out. Uh, May gets um, arrested because it's supposed that she may have murdered or made several people disappear in addition to Rizzio, in addition to Willow Rhodes. So she uh, defends herself. Eventually, uh, I guess to cut to the chase, she is found guilty of eight charges, eight charges of grand theft, and she's sentenced to go to San Quentin. And her attorney, a man named Cochran, appeals the verdict. So she's actually go to San Quentin. She's been being held in Los Angeles. And uh, her attorney, Cochran, uh, goes to the uh, Supreme Court of California and says, this is unfair. This is a religious matter. Debbie knew what he was doing. All this other Im- evidence that was introduced during the trial about Willow Road's death, about Rizzio's disappearance, has nothing at all to do with this case. Those were, were prejudicial to May. The only thing that was that should have been considered is, did my client defraud Dabney by making these promises, which were made in the sphere of religious belief? And the Supreme Court found for May. They said, you know, you're right. Yes, all this other stuff was absolutely insane. This is the craziest stuff we've ever heard. That's pretty much what's actually right in their opinion. But none of that matters. She was accused of fraud. And we don't see any evidence of fraud. Uh, Clifford Dabney and the other people who followed May are like anyone else. They can believe what they want. If they want to give money to a religious cause, they can. They can ask for the money back later if they don't get what they're promised. That's just the nature of our country. You have freedom to practice religion. So uh, ultimately, the, the Blackburn cult didn't dissolve at that time. It actually went on for decades longer, but it had lost all its momentum. It, it never gained any new members. It stayed intact more or less for 10 years. It relocated a few times. Uh, members began to slowly fade away, but that was essentially the, the end. Who knows what might have happened had Dabney not decided to actually uh, make a civil suit. It might have gone on further. That was pretty much uh, a nail in the coffin for uh, May's ambitions. One of the crazier things about this story is where the newspapers went with all of this. The reporters writing these sensational stories once news of this cult broke open. I mean, their imaginations just went wild. Oh, right. I mean, you think about all the things that the reporters had to work with. Ward Blackburn, his his crazy appearances, his uh, stories about counting cars and collecting rain as part of ritual. Uh, there was another uh, concord in the form of ritual where May required her mother, Jenny Blackburn, to be chained to her bed for two months. There's like this long chain connected to her bed that she could go up and down the steps. But she literally changed her mother to a bed for two months. And her mother said, it's fine. You know, I had, had no problem with it. It was commanded by an angel, so that's fine. They had these rituals where uh, a horse was hung upside down. They had new trucks purchased so they could be sacrificed as part of Concords. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And of course, the darker side where you had Sammy Riccio disappeared. You had uh, Willow Rhodes being uh, dying under suspicious circumstances and then essentially mummified and buried beneath her, her parents' floorboards. You know, you couldn't make this stuff up. If you put this stuff in fiction, your editor would say you've gone too far. But this all really happened. Uh, and that's, again, is why this cult really interested me, because every day there was something new. And this is all this all actually happened. It is so. Well, I guess it's been long enough now where we can say it was colorful um, at the time. It was just bizarre combination of uh, tragedy and comedy and insanity. So what really fascinates me about all of this is, is who knew what, who was in on the grift and who really believed all of this. 
you, you've already said that May herself obviously set this up as a con, but might have started believing her own fiction. But May's own mother bought it all and believed her daughter was conversing with angels and, and directing her. Right, right. And, and that's that's the hardest part in all of this is knowing what May or her mother or Ruth or any of them in the cult actually believed. You know, May was interviewed by um, psychologists later, and they basically say, said, you know, she's she's not perfectly stable. She's what well, they call it hysterical, but I think that means mentally troubled. Uh, they said Ruth was mentally darkened. Jenny seemed uh, completely out of it. But yeah, there were, it's, it's difficult to say. I think, you know, probably Martha. Martha was a true believer for a long time, probably up until uh, Willow Rose wasn't resurrected. May was at heart a con artist, but I think she actually had some issues where she began to believe what she taught. Ruth, for the rest of her life, uh, seems to have uh, actually believed some of this. She was writing pamphlets into the uh, 70s about some of the cult theology. At least they were copyrighted. We don't know what happened with them. Was, was she circulated them? Uh, we don't know, but this was decades later. Gail Banks, who was really probably the smartest person in the outfit, he knew a lot of history. He studied uh, Greek philosophy and stuff like that. And I think, honestly... He was supposed to be translating the angel's visions uh, that May received. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of this was, when we say interpretation, maybe he actually authored some of this. Uh, because some of the, if you read some of May's writings, she did actually publish one book called The Origin of God. And if you read it, it you know, it's, it's, it's all metaphysical gibberish, but it's pretty sophisticated metaphysical gibberish. So it's possible that he... Um, actually authored some of these ideas and concepts and just passed them on to May and May passed them on to her believers. Uh, Mary Stewart, basically, the, you know, a lot of these are the Divine Order of the Great Eleven, and there's another sister organization, uh, the Divine Science of Joshua. They were incorporated, and the incorporation documents listed people who would get shares and profits from these uh, religious orders. And I have to think almost anyone who signed those documents, like Mary Stewart, for example, had to be on the inside, right? I mean, they're they're one of the principles of the corporations. The generally speaking, most of the the poor and more impoverished people they were they were never on these things. So yeah, I think there were there were some people who were really insiders who realized this entire thing was a con. There were others who were absolute true believers for the rest of their lives, and then there were people like perhaps May, Ruth, and a few others who got reality and fiction conflated, but they were making money at it, so they just kept it going as long as they could. There are a ton of television shows these days about all of these modern day cults. You'd think people would learn from history, right? The same tactics may use to rope followers in, in the 1920s are still being used today. It, it's true. It's, 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 and a lot of the cults that were concurrent, even back in the 1920s, um, we're doing the exact same thing, and it's always pretty much the same uh, process, right? Where you find some people, you say that you're a representative of God, that God's appointed you for some special purpose, and that you as a follower need to give up all your worldly possessions and give them to the cult leader. And there might be little miracles here and there, and at some point there's going to be some great uh, apocalyptic event or revelation, which of course never happens, and it usually ends in tragedy uh, or deaths. Yeah, it's the same thing again and again. But I, I'm not sure that'll ever stop. Maybe it's just human psychology where every generation has to learn this lesson for itself. Exactly. So tell us where people can get your book and tell us about you. 